Awesome. Well, good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, if I haven't met you, I do see a few familiar faces, but my name is Brooke Snyder. I'm a workforce and sustainability specialist in the Office of Community Living. Um, the last two, two and a half years, I've been working on the direct care workforce team um, on those ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act initiatives, um, but we're kind of shifting gears here. Um, I had the pleasure of working on ARPA 110, which was the rural provider sustainability and investments. And so this is kind of the continuation of that work. And so we're excited to have you here and just kind of talk about what's next um, and talk about um, the information that was received in that report and also the GIS heat map that we received as part of that um, project as well. So thank you for being here. I do have a couple folks from HICPUF here that are helping me as well. Um, Heather Johnson, my supervisor, is on the call, so you'll see her um, helping me with questions and things. But um, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so just a few housekeeping things. Uh, we are recording. We know folks can't always join us um, in real time. And so this is just a, a reminder to be cognizant of what you're sharing and the things you're asking, uh, avoid sharing protected health information, that kind of stuff. Just be cognizant that this will be posted um, and it will be shared out. And so um, what you're saying and what you're typing can be captured. So that's just our, that's our friendly reminder of that. Um, we have the Q&A function open. Um, it's really important for us to be able to capture questions and answers just because, again, folks aren't able to join us in real time. Um, so I think we'll use the chat mainly for sharing links, um, but we probably will use the Q&A function predominantly to answer questions. Um, I'm going to go through the content here, and then we'll take a significant amount of time at the end to answer those questions and make sure we get through everything. If there are questions we have to take back, we'll make sure we connect with you um, the best way to do that and make sure that those answers are posted as well. So um, we'll work through that Q&A function. We will be posting the slides along with the recording. Um, it'll be posted on the Rural Provider Sustainability Heat Map page. Um, right now, the only thing on that website is just the heat map um, and an accessibility narrative of the map itself, but we'll probably be adding a report to that. So that title may change a little bit. It's probably gonna be Rural Provider Sustainability versus just the heat map. And so that might change a little bit, but I did just drop that link in the chat. Um, if you're listening by phone, welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, to speak or ask questions, if you're not able to use that Q&A function, it's star six to unmute your line or star nine to raise your hands. Um, I have turned on closed captioning, which you can um, control yourself on your Zoom toolbar, the black toolbar there, and then meeting information, as I mentioned, will be posted on that rural sustainability heat map dashboard. Um, I will let you know that the report itself is not posted yet. It's in some final accessibility checks, um, but we're really hoping to be able to post the report, the recording, and the slides all at the same time, hopefully by the end of the week. So fingers crossed for that. Um, so yeah, that's just some housekeeping for us. So let's jump right in, right? So um, this is a continuation, um, or I like to think of it as a launching point from ARPA 110, which was Rural Provider Sustainability and Investments. Throughout that project, we worked with a vendor, Health Management Associates, and it really was broken down into two phases. The first phase was to do a GIS heat map um, to create this to really be able to identify care deserts across the state. And we do that by using claims data and looking at member to provider ratios. And so there are some caveats and things that we'll talk about, but we did get that heat map created. It is live. I'll go through that in just a second. Um, but that was really phase one of this uh, project that we worked with HMA for. We worked with the same vendor for both phases. Um, and the second phase was really the shared, re re excuse me, the shared resources and recommendations report. <laughs> and that really digs into um, supporting our rural providers in sharing resources, pooling resources, really taking a look at what's available in these rural communities, doing a gap analysis and figuring out how we can pool resources, how we can share, and not just providers, right? Looking at just the important infrastructure in our rural small communities and seeing ways that we can partner and learn from each other. And so that's really what this report um, digs into a little bit. Um, and so we'll talk about that in just a moment. But first and foremost, phase one with the heat map tool. As I mentioned, it is currently live. Um, inputs include um, calendar year, uh, 2019 through 2023 currently, benefit type, HCBS waiver type, or state plan waiver type, and then also service type. And so there's several different inputs that you can change um, to see the map change. Um, the map is updated each year with previous year's claims data. And so we're always kind of a year behind. We're always pulling from claims data, but that allows us to see year over year change because it's actually what's being billed for in those areas. Um, and so usually um, claims data is available in April. So we're planning for our next update to be starting in April, 2025. 
Um, we worked really hard this year with our data analytics team to figure out the best way to update this. Um, and so it's pretty streamlined. We have a dedicated team that's been working on this. Um, and so they're available just for us to continue to update year after year. Um, but then also just if there's questions or if there's issues that we're running into, it's really an iterative kind of map. And so we can make those adjustments year to year as needed. Um, just a gentle reminder, it should be used in tandem with Find a Doctor and other waiver amenity tools. It's not a standalone tool, though we do feel like it has some great information. It doesn't have all the information. And we know that, that using claims data inherently has um, some limitations. So we just want to be mindful of that. With that specifically, there are some caveats with that heat map tool. Um, travel time within counties. We know our counties are large and we know that there are likely chances that you're serving an entire county, which could be 90 to 100 miles across. And so that's hard to capture within this map. We did talk about doing zip codes uh, versus county level data, but then you get into safe harbor and a lot of that information just ends up being blinded. And so counties gave us a good balance of being able to capture information without blinding it, but then also knowing that those counties are still quite large for many of our providers. Um, we also know that the Accountable Care Collaborative, the ACC regions will be changing, be going from seven to four as, as far as I know. <laughs> and so that will look different year over year as well. So right now through 2023 and likely through 2024, we have seven ACC regions that were broken down on the map. But as that changes, we'll work with our data analytics team to change that. And so we know that 2023 data on this map will probably look different than 2025, 2026, for example. And so we wanna make sure we can reconcile that and understand that the, if we're looking at year over year, how that makes sense. Um, likely it's just really digging into that county data, but we really wanna be mindful of that as we move forward with those regions changing. Um, lastly, it's really, since it's claims data, it's really where members receiving services and not necessarily where the provider resides. So I'm over here in Montrose County. Um, and so, I know that our Montrose County providers are likely providing services in Uray and San Miguel County. So with the map and with the claims data, it may show a provider presence in Uray and San Miguel counties when that's not typical. Um, likely those services are coming from a larger county like Montrose County. And so really just keeping in mind that it's where our members are receiving services and not necessarily where our provider resides. And so that's where you're important too as the ones that are actually providing this information. Um, or that are using this information is I know Tom probably knows exactly what counties he's providing services in. And so that's where you can kind of, um, you know, take into consideration the work that you're doing and you can kind of uh, suss out those caveats as you're using the math. So we really like it. We think it's great information, but of course it does come with some limitations just as we're using claims data. Um, so those are just things we like to keep in mind and reminders of that. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and drop that heat map tool in the chat one more time um, for you all to have. And again, we'll make sure that these are all posted publicly and you're able to access them after this meeting as well. All right, so that's part one. Phase two really was, um, we had great big plans um, that the, the vendor was going to be able to, to scan the country and find all these great shared resource frameworks and models that we were gonna be able to model here in Colorado. We were gonna plug and play. And when we talk about shared resources, again, we're talking about shared, whether that's shared staffing models, that's shared administrative costs, IT, human resources. We thought that several states across the nation were probably already doing this and we would be able to just learn from them and tap in. And that didn't quite work out the way that we had planned. Um, and so what the vendor ended up doing was they were able to find us a couple examples, which I'll go over later in the report. But what this ends up being actually is recommendations and how HICPUF and our rural communities can come together um, and how HICPUF can really support the creation of these shared resources um, and these shared frameworks and these shared models. And so hopefully in five years, when another state is looking at this, maybe they'll write reports about what Colorado is doing because we weren't able to find anything about what other states are doing. We know folks are implementing this. It's just apparently not formalized or it's not written down. Um, and like I said, we were able to find a couple, which was exciting, but um, we certainly thought there would be just a little bit more robust information. <laughs> um, and so we kind of had to shift gears um, midway through, but what's a good project if you don't have to pivot, right? Um, and so the first one is really collaborating with local communities. And that seems simple, uh, simple, right? Like that seems like, well, just talk to people. Well, we want to make this a little bit more robust than that. 
we want to collaborate with our local communities um, in, in the form of, I don't know, like a road show, maybe listening sessions. Um, we really want to get out and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with providers. We want to get these communities together. All the folks that you're working with, right? Like your rural health clinics, your hospitals, your other providers, your care navigators. Um, we want to get out there and talk to the local communities to hear what your individual barriers are. I can assume I know because I live on the Western Slope, but until I hear it from you, um, that, that doesn't mean a whole lot and we can't really act upon that. And so we want to have these listening sessions. We want to have these row shows. Um, we really want to connect with you all and start having those conversations. We want you to have a contact person um, or, you know, a contact position. I don't want it to be person specific for me necessarily, but a contact position for you to have to have these questions. I know you have a ton of resources already um, that you probably have created uh, since you've been doing this work and, and having these communities um, and serving your communities, but we want to we want to streamline that for you as much as we can. Um, and so we've kind of already begun doing this just in small scale, just being really opportunistic, really. Um, I see that Tasia Sin is on the call here. Tasia had an equity study, um, and I was lucky enough to be invited to a couple of the listening sessions that they had here on the Western Slope. And through those listening sessions with Tasia, um, again, just being really opportunistic and hearing the issues of the communities, we were able to really kind of jump in and start doing this work a couple of months before we had anticipated. Um, and so now from those listening sessions, I made connections. Um, we have what we call just like a Western Slope check-in where I just get on a call every two months with folks from this region. We have our local ARC, we have our care navigators, which is Tri-County Health Network. We have a couple providers. And from that, we just get together, we chat. They make connections to other people. Um, our last meeting, they're like, hey, I know somebody in Craig who's having issues. So let me connect you with them. And so those are the connections we wanna make. Um, we want to uh, open this space up, have these listening sessions, but then also open up conversations um, so you feel like you have a connection here within the department. Um, so through those conversations with our Western Slope check-in, I call it, we'll come up with a better name, um, but right now that's what we have. Um, we were able to, to kind of learn about a couple provider hiccups, right? We had providers who were trying to expand their services and bring on new um, waiver services or services and and um, in general, and they were running into hiccups. And I don't want to get involved in, in individual provider applications or individual provider issues, but if it's a systemic issue, I want to be able to understand timelines. I want to be able to understand process and just get in there and kind of shake the trees for you. And so we were able to work with a couple providers to help do that. Um, and that's how I see this kind of working uh, just in the long term. It's just having a resource for folks to reach out to, um, just to kind of just to kind of close the loop of communication. Um, and so that's kind of what we're hoping with recommendation one. Uh, recommendation two is, is maximizing resources and skills. And I will tell you, the, pu the public report goes into a little more detail. I just took the highlights for this so I could talk through them. Um, but maximizing resources and skills, it's I want to start bringing folks together, right? And so that's communities of practice. That's stakeholder engagement opportunities. And I know you're thinking that's just another meeting on my calendar, right? I don't have time for that. Um, but really just providing an opportunity for us to come together to talk about this um, through learning, shared experiences, troubleshooting. Again, what I'm doing kind of with the Western Slope check-in, I'd like to take live um, to start learning what you're doing in your individual communities. I want to say so-and-so up in Northwest Colorado is doing this. I know so-and-so in Southeast Colorado is doing this. Like, Let's let's coordinate. Let's figure out what's happening. Let's streamline this because ideally, this is a resource to help save time uh, for you and save time and resources for you. So that's maximizing resources and skills that really rolls nicely into recommendation three, which is community and partner engagement. And I know so far these all kind of sound the same, but in my head, I really parsed them out. I promise. <laughs> uh, community and partner engagement is standardizing that. The worst thing we can do is go out and have these conversations and have this roadshow with you, and then never talk to you again and not standardize it. And so, community and partner engagement really puts that on a regular cadence and really makes sure that we are connecting you um, not only to HICPUF with the HICPUF, but with other providers on a regular cadence. So you can plan on something. You can plan on having contact. You can plan on a meeting quarterly, bi-monthly, whatever. It's standardizing that. Um, so it feels routine um, and it feels like something you can bank on. Um, so we really want to make sure that we're continuing this engagement, not just listening, but also coming back to you with answers. Hey, we looked at this, we said this, um, and this is what we're coming back with. And that's when we really start building out their shared resources, right? It's about hearing the issues, partnering on the issues, and then starting to build a framework to, to, um, to really uh, 
work on those issues all together. And so that's where we really start to standardize. This is in recommendation three. And again, the public report goes into this in a little more detail, but this is kind of how I see this rolling out. Um, recommendation four, we continuously want to evaluate. That's just good. That's just good practice, right? It's an iterative process. This may not work. The, 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 the cadence of meetings may not work. We may need to ramp up some times of the year. We may need to scale back some times of the year. And so we just want to be able to evaluate not only the time that we're coming together to meet um, for communities of practice, but we also want to be able to evaluate whatever models or frameworks we create. And so if something is working really well in Western Colorado, but it's not working in Eastern Colorado, well, we want to be able to evaluate that. And, and fill in the gaps. I know that at the end of this, this is not a one size fits all for every region. Every region, especially every rural region, is a very, very specific in what they need and how they need support. Um, and so it's just super iterative. I don't know if that's a survey that we come out with every meeting, um, but just know that the evaluation component is really important to us um, because we don't, one, we don't want it to, to stalemate. We don't want it to, to feel um, stale at any point, but we also want this to continue to be a good use of your time because we know your time is precious. Um, recommendation five is leverage existing structures. I wanna take a moment to just celebrate the fact that especially our rural providers, you're providing care in spite of it all. I know you know that you can provide more if you had the right supports, you had the right information, you had the right resources, but you're doing it and we appreciate that so much. Like you're making sure that folks in your area are receiving care in spite of all your challenges. Um, so we know that you have relationships and natural resources and organic supports that you've already leveraged in your communities. And so we really wanna make sure that as we go through this information and we have these frameworks that we wanna start bringing in partners and relationships that you already have. So leveraging those existing structures. Um, a great example of this is again, with the Western Slope check-in and the listening sessions, we've heard of something like basically a high, a high touch list. And so we know that some folks frequent areas. We, we all have had interactions with, with folks that are seeking services or need support in our communities. And so if Joe shows up at the hospital and he's on that high touch list, we can refer to that and we can say, Joe, I know you're working with Sally over at the county on getting connected to some resources. How's that going? And so we're not just in this continual loop of refer, refer, refer. We're actually able to kind of keep track of where Joe is at um, in that process. And so just just a communication loop, right? Just something like that makes it so much easier for you um, to be able to do the work that you do so you're not continuously hung up in just the churn of trying to get these folks services. You can actually kind of keep track. And that's just one example of leveraging your existing structures. And so that was folks from our rural hospital, our rural health clinics, our county partners, and our providers. They all kind of had like this high touch list that they all kind of had access to. Um, Real vague, right? But like, you know, kind of who these people are. You don't want to, you know, do any HIPAA violations or anything. But just to be able to like connect and talk and know that Joe is is trying to receive services over here. Um, so maybe let's check in on that. And just, I don't know, just being able to coordinate services was, it was interesting. Like, it's just something that you all are doing and you're creative and you're making it work. So let's leverage those. Let's maximize those. And let's standardize those a little bit. So it's not so much work for you to continue to do that. Um, recommendation six is going to be that continued focus on workforce. I know that the biggest barrier that you're probably facing as a rural provider, or at least continue to face, is your workforce. Having a sustainable workforce in your areas is going to always be a barrier to being able to provide services. Um, and so I'm lucky enough to be able to been on the direct care workforce team the last two and a half years and then working on those several ARPA initiatives. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about a few of those later. but um, just know that the continued focus on workforce, just because ARP is over, that does not mean that the workforce um, dedication is going to go away. That's gonna to continue to be a focus of our team and of um, PickPuff in general, because we know that that's always gonna be a barrier. We know that that's always gonna be an issue. And so to continue to focus on recruitment and retention um, statewide, but also specifically in our rural areas is something that we'll continue to do. So we've worked on that for, I feel like the last two, two and a half years. Um, I feel like we have some good stuff in the works, but know that that doesn't end just because ARPA ends. So um, continued focus on workforce came from the recommendation report. And then the last uh, recommendation was consideration of geographic rate modifiers. And so if you're unfamiliar with this, this is, this is looking at different parts of the state and adjusting um, the rates that different parts of the state are, are reimbursed at, given their specific challenges or individual challenges of their area. And so we did use ARPA funds to go ahead and take a look at this. 
we knew that we probably weren't going to ever have an opportunity like ARPA again. And so we wanted to pour some money into um, the geographic rate modifiers. We had the data from the GIS heat map too. So we asked our vendor to really dig into the data that they used to build that map and give us some scenarios of geographic heat, uh, rate modifications and how that might look um, across the landscape you know, given budget neutrality and those kinds of things. And so um, they did work some of that up for us. It is included in the public report. There's, um, I believe, three different scenarios that they worked out for us. Um, just to go through that, um, again, that's, there's there's so much more than that. And that's not necessarily the, something that our team is able to implement just by ourselves. But we did want to take the time and information that we had with ARPA to really ask them to dig into it. So it is included in the report. Um, it has been shared with the rates team. And so kind of as we move forward and as budget allows, that's something that we can certainly look at um, in terms of just making sure that folks are being reimbursed, um, you know, directly related to their individual struggles across the state. So something that we looked at, uh, definitely a recommendation to continue to consider. Um, and we're glad we took the time and the money to do that, again, because we don't know when ARPA, that's likely never going to happen again. So we really wanted to use those resources um, to get something on paper for us to use kind of as we move forward. So that kind of wraps up the recommendations part of it. Again, it's really just how can HICPUF support rural communities in doing this? And really that's gonna depend on what we hear in those listening sessions. Um, I think the, the trouble and also the exciting part of this is that there's, there's really no framework for it. Um, so we're all kind of building the ship as we're sailing it, which I, I think is, is fun, but can also be challenging. Um, but it also allows us a certain level of creativity, which I know you're good at doing because you're having to provide services in these rural areas. Um, and so this is just a chance for HICPUF to be able to support you, dedicated staff to be able to support this effort um, and really just, making it work for um, each region individually. So we're excited. Um, we know there's a lot of work ahead and we know it's not gonna be easy, um, but these are kind of at least the roadmap that we have and we'll continue to build that out as we go. This is a lot of text on one slide and I'm not gonna read it through um, completely, but know that the report does talk about some existing frameworks. Um, these were the ones that they were, well, the first two are the ones that the vendor was able to find, and then the other two were ones that um, our team was able to kind of put together, just in terms of what we were looking for specifically. Um, so Wilderness Health is Northeast in Minnesota um, and Northwest Michigan, and they really focus on um, shared services, including data integration, care continuum improvements, alternative payment methods, and they have a talent pool strategy for workforce training, network, and recruitment. Um, so we really liked that model that they had put together. We also know that Northeast Minnesota and Northwest Wisconsin face a lot of the same rural issues that we have here in Colorado. Um, Lutheran Services of America, Great Plains uh, Senior Services Collaborative, that is a mouthful. But again, rural Minnesota, North Dakota and Montana. And we know that there's a lot of overlap between North Dakota and Montana. We know that we see a lot of the same things in those rural areas that we see here in Colorado. Um, so we really like this one as well. Um, emphasizes shared resources, best practices, and accountability for community health. So that takes a little broader focus, again, on incorporating rural health clinics, hospitals, that kind of thing. So we really like that. And it really focus, uh, focuses around um, aging and, and older adults, but still, I think it's a framework that we could probably work um, into our individuals with disabilities population as well. Um, the other two I found, um, a handful of you probably are familiar with the Carl Colorado Rural Health Center, um, and you may work with them, um, but they support rural health care providers and communities across Colorado. They offer resources and training in areas like admin, funding, policy, IT, and workforce development. So this hub really provides access to valuable information that you don't have to then go out and find on your own. So it's hoping that you can leverage some of these resources and then allow you to reinvest your funding in other needs. Um, and so we found that to be incredibly beneficial. Um, again, not quite what we're looking for with shared resources, but still a hub of information that you're able to leverage and then reinvest um, in ways that you see fit and providing services. And then this one is, uh, go with me on this one. <laughs> If there's one thing that rural communities are familiar with, um, typically it's BOCES or Board of Cooperative Educational Services. Our school districts uh, use BOCES and across school districts in rural areas, they really, really lean into them. And so I took this educational education example and said, what about doing something like this for healthcare? 
Um, and so if you're unfamiliar with BOCES, they, it's, a, it's a pool of several different school districts that will work together to share staff specifically around a physical therapist or an occupational therapist or school psychologist, those specialized services that one school district may not be able to afford for themselves, they'll pool across several different school districts. And this might work specifically with specialized services, but I think we could use a BOCES example in healthcare and, and in shared resources because it's, it's a framework that's already made. It's one that we're familiar with in our rural areas. Um, and I think we could tweak it just enough to be able um, to really have a cooperative bunch of community providers, community health centers, um, care coordination, folks coming together to just share resources. Maybe you have a trainer coming in um, and you wanna push that out and say, hey folks, I'm having this training come in, send your staff if you need to, Think, things like that. So um, while not currently used in healthcare settings, at least not formally, um, I thought that BOCES was an interesting example because it is something that we are familiar with in, um, in rural areas specifically. So those are all linked in the report and they're also linked here in the slides for you to take a peek and look into um, if you're ready to get rolling. Um, but certainly know that these are the things that we're kind of looking at as we build out frameworks. And it may not look anything like any of these. Um, and I think again, that's kind of the beauty of it. Um, so just a quick overview of some existing resources before um, I open it up for questions here. Um, Sorry, I lost my mouse there. That's That's gotta happen at least one time. <laughs> um, and so we do have the Direct Care Workforce Base Wage Dashboard. Again, this really leans into recommendation six of continued focus on the workforce. These are really things that we have worked on building up over the last two and a half years. And so these resources really focus on workforce initiatives, um, but we have the Base Wage Dashboard, um, which shows um, since the base wage was implemented, um, it shows kind of wages um, throughout Colorado and through HCBS providers with the different services. So that's a great resource. Um, Direct Care Careers Colorado. Um, I'm going to wait until the end because I'm going to have Heather, my supervisor, talk a little bit more about all the robust um, features of that site. Um, but we did have Direct Care Spotlight, which was a public awareness campaign that we used ARPA funding for. And so that um, really has a lot of recruitment material that we would like for our providers to use as they see fit. And so if you're looking for direct care workers or direct care staff, and you wanna have kind of some fun, um, interesting pieces to use, there's media files, there's media kits, there's social media images, there's some messaging on there. That's all free for you to use um, just as you see fit. And that will remain active um, for as long as it's relevant. So that website will continue to kind of be live. Um, and then we have our direct care workforce collaborative, which I know a handful of folks that are here on the meeting um, have joined us there at the collaborative, but that um, the collaborative is really keen on um, bringing information about the direct care workforce, not just what's happening in Hickpuff, but what's happening in other state agencies, because um, there's a ton of work happening around this space. Um, and we just want to make it a hub of information so you can come to the meeting quarterly um, for an hour and a half and just get all the information that's happening in this space. Um, and then we do have action groups that meet out of that too, if you want to be a little bit more involved. But um, the collaborative is really keen on just providing um, all interested stakeholders, but a lot of times it ends up being provider specific on uh, like Colorado Secure Savings. So if you're not able to offer retirement, um, there's an option for you to be able to leverage Colorado Secure Savings so your workers have retirement. Um, Connect for Health Colorado. If you're not able to offer traditional health insurance, there are some options for employers to be able to leverage Connect for Health Colorado to do that. So really just trying to bring resources that are already existing and available just to one place for you to be able to get that information and use it. Um, and so we love our Direct Care Workforce Collaborative. Um, our next meeting is actually December 4th. Um, and so I'm gonna drop a handful of links in the chat for these resources. And while I do that, Heather, would you like to talk a little bit more about Direct Care Careers Colorado? I can, and let me see if I can share. I like to make sound effects here. All right. Um, I'm assuming you all can see my screen as a presenter. I cannot. I can um, see it, yeah. All right, perfect. So uh, the Direct Care Careers Colorado is a site that is open to HCBS providers, long-term home health providers, and case providers. Uh, we do at HICPUF control on the back end, which providers sign up for this. Uh, part of that is to make sure it is really for our population and to reduce some of the noise that you might see on um, 
uh, public sites uh, for job searching. So direct care careers, um, there's three states that are participating in it, uh, Texas, North Dakota, and us currently. Um, so you can log in as a provider and you can log in as an individual user. So my workspace looks a little bit different, but so one of the aspects of this is job matching. You can post jobs, it'll auto match you. Um, it's a good way to get some job postings out. Uh, we're kind of in the, if you build it, they will come scenario of getting people to use it, jobs beyond their workers to see or prospective workers to see, hey, this is for me. Um, and so uh, it, it really is gonna take a lot of development to get that going. One of the other features of the site, which, um, our uh, person who works on this, John, does a lot to do is really just trying to link people to resources. There's a lot of training videos. There is a lot of information on just resources for an individual uh, regarding family, regarding uh, Connect for Colorado. Maybe they need some benefits in their own life. Really just trying to get uh, people connected. These are just uh, publicly available sources, but we do have a search feature and I don't want to make people dizzy here and by topics. And so uh, could be a good way to provide some supplementary information for folks or go in and look for some resources. And most recently, we have released our uh, training catalog. So we have 30 training modules on there now. I will show you A to Z. Uh, these are ideally for entry into the direct care work, homemaker, personal care work. They're also designed with a universal structure as much as possible that you could because we do serve across the continuum. So when you sign up, you can see there'll be a little highlight of what is in there. There's uh, the time it is, and you can take, you can enroll to take the classes. Folks who take these classes will get a certificate. Um, our, our goal is this, is this is portable training for folks, so they don't have to continue to take the training when they move and they start with a new provider. Um, there would just be the skills check that is needed for that. So really wanting to provide this training, it's standardized and it's available for free to all folks. Um, the goal is is getting training out there to release some of the training burden on the providers, especially if they're already contracting with other. That's a cost they're incurring. Can we help them with that cost? So then they can reinvest those funds into recruitment or retention efforts. So really invite folks to go in and check out the training. Even if you have a very robust training department, are you willing to accept this training from somebody who starts at your agency? So we, and and there, there's something you'd like to improve on the, on the training. So we really want that out there for folks to access. Uh, the other part of this training that we really want to highlight is it's there for natural supports, for unpaid caregivers. People think caregiving is just a natural thing, and it's not, especially when you're caregiving, uh, providing care for your loved one. So we're really wanting to get that as a resource out for folks um, for the training. So just so you know, there's 30 modules on there now. We will be adding about 20 more modules that are soft skills, really for folks who's first time in the workforce. Um, about setting boundaries, about communication, professionalism tips. So those will be released on the site in December. And uh, anytime we can add more training to this, we are happy to do so. So just wanting to let folks know about that. This is also a way that we can get messages out to folks. We do like to do a lot of announcing of free trainings that we find. And so uh, we just would encourage you to have your staff sign up for the site, um, even just for their own benefit. And I know Brooke did mention uh, the direct care uh, spotlight. And so these are videos just, just showing you real live. Uh, all the videos link folks to the direct care career site. So if we're not saying that has to be the only way you recruit, but if you also have your posts on there and your social media will direct people to the DCC site and then they can see your job postings there. So we, we're trying to kind of make it a full circle thing, but really just giving you a little visual of infographics and social media and stuff you can use that highlights what direct care work is. Feel free to use it in your own marketing campaigns um, just for some consistency. And because sometimes it's a little hard to get those items because there's a cost to it. We just want to help with that recruitment effort. All right, I will pause there and stop sharing. Okay. Perfect, thank you, Heather. All right. So I'm going to get us back to our existing resources page. And I believe we're actually at a point now um, where I just want to talk about next steps and then we'll jump right into questions. So if you have any burning questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A um, and we'll get to those here in just a minute. So next steps really include um, leaning into those recommendations one through three. And so kind of what we're asking is if you're a local agency, um, 
any agency that works with providers, um, whether you're a provider yourself or you uh, support provider agencies, if you're uh, willing to help coordinate regional listening sessions to host us, um, to host me specifically, <laughs> um, to do these regional listening sessions, we'd love to, to talk with you to start working on that. Um, they can be in person or virtual, uh, depending on regional needs. And again, we'll probably offer both um, because we know, again, travel's not always um, possible in these areas. So we would have maybe an in-person session and then offer a Zoom link as well for folks to join us from outside that region. Um, and then from these listening sessions, start um, coordinating resources and making a plan for purposeful engagement um, and to start building these shared resources and these models and these frameworks. Um, it's really gonna be about connection. It's gonna be about um, networking. Um, more than you just having a direct line to HICPUF, I want you to have a direct line to other rural providers because I think the best place for us to learn um, is from one another. And so those communities of practice and being able to reach out and have connections across the state is gonna be really important um, for us to lean into. And so we just wanna formalize it a little bit. Again, I know you're doing incredible work and so let's just help maximize and support that. So that's really where we're, where we're leaning into now and that's kind of where we'll be focusing in the next foreseeable future. Um, We'll get these listening sessions done and then we'll really start building it out. So if you want to help coordinate that, I'd love to talk with you. I'm going to drop my email in the chat here in just a moment. But um, at this point, I think we'd really like to take some time for questions. Um, so let me get my email in the chat and then I'll start in our Q&A. All right, so the first question, um, Tom asked, can you give us a snapshot of the three scenarios for geographic modifiers? Um, I know you said they'd be in the report. So um, I'm gonna give you my best description, Tom, knowing that I'm not a data person, um, but I'm gonna give you what I can read here from the public facing report on what that looks like. Um, and so there are, um, oh, Candace, Candace, would you like to answer this question live? Oh, no, I was just clicking the button so that it would tell us that we were answering it. Go ahead, Brooke. Sorry. Oh, perfect. I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> no, no, no. Doing you're doing great. great. Oh, perfect. Okay. So um, scenario one is a budget neutral regional smoothing. Um, and so I'm just going to read it from the from the report. Um, so in this scenario, HMA designed the rate impact to be budget neutral on spending across the entire waiver population. Um, this results in transferring funds from the state's high access regions. And so high access in this regard are folks that are able to access services with very little issue. Um, so they're not our care deserts. They're good access to care. So transferring funds from the state's high access regions uh, to its low access regions. Um, and then we have medium access regions. They would remain unchanged. So that's really um, smoothing it across and really taking uh, funds from high access to low access. That's not ideal. We don't want to take from anybody. But that's one of the scenarios that they came up with to really uh, speak to these geographic rate modifiers. Um, scenario two, um, regional smoothing with statewide funding increase. And so this really builds on that initial one um, used in scenario one, but re after reallocating funds um, from high access to low access, then it's applied a uniform percentage increase to distribute to additional funding to each region. So what we would do is we would smooth with budget neutral, high access to low access, and then everybody would get a smaller rate increase across the board. Um, so that again, there's still some moving from high to low. Um, again, we don't love that, um, but it might it might be, we don't wanna take from anyone, but it may be um, a situation where if we wanna make sure that our access, um, our lower access areas have it, it might be a consideration. Again, these are just scenarios, these are just suggestions, um, and we're, you know, we would do some stakeholder engagement and things like that to, to see which one of these would work um, if the budget uh, looks different um, or able to accommodate any of these. And then scenario three is low access increase only. Um, so again, it assumes the availability of additional funds, but is designed to target increases to low access regions without any corresponding increases or decreases to other regions. And so this one, we're just pumping it into low access without touching medium or high access at all. Um, so for this person's purpose, um, say we have a 2% increase, um, but the additional dollars only flow to low access regions. And that's kind of scenario three. And so it's, again, it's just pumping into low access, leaving medium and high um, untouched. So those are the three scenarios. It digs into a lot more detail in the report. It talks about how we identified high access versus low access um, and where that information comes from. So I'd really encourage you to take a peek at that, um, but that just gives you a quick snapshot um, of those different scenarios. Um, Sarah Sims, the heat map does not take into consideration services that are not being offered, but are wanted. 
Um, this seems to be an integral component of identifying care deserts. Are there plans to include this somewhere? Yes, Sarah. Um, so just in the nature of using claims data, um, we're only seeing what services are being used, right? Like we're only pulling up things that are being billed. Um, and so I think there's probably some conversations that we could have with our data team on if there's data we could pull um, to be able to show what services are wanted. We know that some folks, they may want these services, but they're not able to get them, right? So then they switch to other services or, or what have you, or they just don't access them. Um, and so by just nature of using claims data, we're really, we're not able to capture that. But I think that's a conversation that we'd be willing to have and just of like, how do you capture that information, right? Like, how are we getting, um, like what's, what's wanted in these areas? What's missing? Maybe that's in those conversations we start having um, and we can find a way to kind of really capture that. Um, Heather, Candace, any thoughts on, on that, um, just on a broader spectrum? Yeah, I mean, that's your people. <laughs> that's a, it's always a, the, the $50,000 question, right, Sarah? Um, and how do you gather that information? And it's really difficult. Um, but as part of this work that Brooke is doing, I think that's a big piece of the conversation that we can continue to look at and figure out how do we capture it accurately? Um, but as of right now, no, it is not a part of the heat map. Um, but, you know, step one, right, uh, for the heat map. And then we can look to see and if you guys have good ideas of ways that we can capture that data. Again, it has to be like real data, not just anecdotal, which is the other difficult part, too. Um, so more to come. And if you have ideas, reach out and let's have further conversations about it. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? I know we had a couple of folks join by phone. So if you're not able to use that Q&A function, feel free to just come on chat um, or come off chat, come off mute, uh, come off mute to, to ask us questions as well. Just as long as they're captured on the recording, we're happy, happy to have those. And just kind of in terms, again, of, of next steps, um, we'll get the recording, the slides, the public report posted. I'm assuming there'll be some more questions that pop out too um, once the full report's uh, posted. Um, so we'll give you time to review that and then certainly follow back up um, with any questions you might have um, as those as you kind of build those out. And then we'll just start, start reaching out regionally just to try to get some of these listening sessions going and start hearing from folks. But I'm not seeing any other questions come in. Um, my email is in the chat if something pops up. Um, but if no other questions are here, any final thoughts, Candace, Heather, that we'd like to, to share before we let folks get on with their day? Just uh, thank you all for joining us today. We're really, really excited about this work. We're really excited about the new heat map, the report that's coming out this week. Um, this is really our first step to digging into this and figuring out how we can create a true sustainable system for all of our rural providers. And so um, this is just really exciting work and we're really happy that you all joined us today. So thank you. Yes, thank you. And feel free to share, share the, share the report, share the recording. Um, we're, we're happy to answer questions throughout, but um, yeah, thank you for being here. Um, and if anything pops up, you know where to find us. Thanks. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.